So you've been reading about this research, these scientists that are saying all saltwater fish are going to be extinct by 2048. I mean, is this a thing? I mean, there's a couple of things that make me believe it more, which is at some point in my life, I remember um, learning about species extinction and being told that once a population uh, goes below a critical point uh, without uh, outside help, right? Without, you know, some sort of artificial promotion of reproduction, there's a, there's a kind of down, downward spiral that they get into where they're going to go extinct. Yeah. I mean, it seems like the early evidence sort of suggests that like they are dying off already at a certain rate that would make that projection seem totally reasonable. Yeah. Yeah. You wonder if the curve flattens out near the end though, right? Like that they're, you know, I mean, this kind of survival of the fittest uh, idea, right? That there will be some. It's just like, yeah, yeah. It's just like what? Like a world without fish? <laughs> <You know>? like... <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. Welcome back to Zero Sum Empire, the podcast is taking a critical census of the 540 mostly anonymous American billionaires. Okay, uh, each week we do something on billionaires in the news. Are you ready for billionaires in the news, Chad? Um, I guess so. All right, let's do it. Billionaires in the news. It was sort of a slow week, wasn't it, for billionaires in the news? Yeah, there weren't really any huge... Uh, earth shattering scandals this week. Um, it was the Chinese family that gave six million dollars to Stanford. Oh, yeah, yeah, and they were they were, that was you know part of this college admission scandal, yeah, and that's sort of ongoing. Maybe we can do a recap of that at some point, yeah, yeah, that's probably a good thing to take a look at in the future at some point. And then who was the guy who was that opioid guy? Um, who was he? Um, John, C- John Kapoor convicted in opioid bribery trial. Oh uh, yeah. What did he do? He bribed, uh, who did he bribe? I don't really know. Here's a, here's a Forbes article. <laughs> <laughs> My involvement, he's an investor. He's claiming that he's just an investor. He pleads not guilty. He bribed some people to do some shit. You know, I don't know. Mm. I don't want to talk about him anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the, like one of the things that one of the things that happened uh, that was um, that's interesting is the uh, Michael Milken uh, held the Milken Institute Global Conference 2019. You want to talk about who this guy is? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that uh, you know Michael Milken is one of those names where you're like, oh yeah, I've heard that name, um, some guy from the 80s, right? And and you would be correct, um, but he is uh, fully engaged in a second act. Uh, in his life, uh, where he is a philanthropist and a kind of thought leader. I think that's what they'd call him, a thought leader. He's a thought He's leader? He's a thought leader when it comes to sort of philanthropy and, uh, um, uh, I mean, fi- basically finding free market solutions to uh, social problems. So... Uh, he's currently working on developing a think tank called, I mean, he already has the Milken Institute, right? But he's, he's working on another one called uh, the American Dream Institute. I that's think. the, that's the title that they landed on. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's not the American Dream Institute. It's actually called the Center for the American Dream. Uh, and it is, uh, yeah, it's one of these places. I mean, there's so many of these places that want to find free market solutions to the problems that we face as a society that are funded by billionaires. I mean, they're all the same. Uh, they're just, uh, ideology propagation machines. They're, they're propaganda mills, uh, um, uh, for, you know, pushing a particular view, uh, like kind of, uh, a benevolent cat, a view of benevolent capitalism. 
So did anything really go down at the conference? Yeah, I mean, the reason that I wanted to talk about it is, uh, I mean, we could talk about, I, I kind of got sidetracked from talking about Michael Milken, uh, who is an, in himself an interesting character, but he had a, the keynote panel was him and uh, our friend from last week, Ray Dalio, uh, and the panel was about reforming capitalism. Um, uh, there is a group of billionaires who are uh, pushing the idea of higher taxation uh, for the wealthy and also, uh, uh, however vaguely, and I, and I will say it's extremely vague, uh, uh, promoting the idea of reforming capitalism uh, to more uh, to distribute wealth in more equitable ways. Uh, I would say like a good half of the conference panels are invite only, which is a little bit weird um, uh, uh, that uh, there and most of those have to do with financial concerns. And uh, uh, the ones that are more focused on philanthropic concerns are a little more public facing. Um, and so that's, you know, I, I think that's a red flag to be a little bit suspicious of. But uh, there's not really any reason to sort of not be suspicious of Michael Milken and the Milken Institute, because if you know his name. He is the he's the guy who he's the widely known as the father of junk bonds. Um, the, the you know I looked up uh, his Wikipedia entry and I uh, um, I was really pleased. You know, anytime you come across a bit of humor in Wikipedia, uh, it's always really gratifying. Uh, so this is the beginning of his Wikipedia entry. It reads: Michael Robert Milken is an American financier and philanthropist. He is noted for his role in the development of the market for high-yield bonds, also known as junk bonds, his conviction following a guilty plea on felony charges for violating U.S. security laws, and his charitable giving. (laughs) Wow. Wow. uh, I mean, he paid more than half a billion dollars in fines. He went to prison. Uh, he, uh, um, is, uh, he, I mean, just the, the number of, so he's a thought leader. He's got this big conference. A bunch of people from the Trump administration are there and a bunch of billionaires are there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. In case I didn't say it already, you got Steve Mnuchin and Steve Mnuchin's brother, uh, who I guess we shouldn't be surprised, but is also like a, uh, a well-known, uh, rich guy. Uh, Wilbur Ross, the kind of shriveled old guy who falls asleep everywhere. Oh, yeah. And uh, yeah, I remember Mick Mulvaney, um, the chief of staff and one of the main sort of like, you know, cutting taxes guys. So like, you know, like uh, as much as uh, uh, there are some people there talking about reforming capitalism, you certainly have this sort of old guard uh, – uh, ideologues of uh, free markets um, uh, who are, you know, making up a probably the lion's share of people who are speaking there. Um, so is there a big takeaway from this conference, uh, like a thing that we should know about? Or is it just more like blather into the ether? Uh, it's it's blather into the ether, right? Like that there's um, the uh, the L.A. Times article actually, you know, uh, makes the, the interesting point that even at the keynote, right, which was where they were supposed to deliver this advice to billionaires is that what we really need to be doing is is thinking about reforming capitalism. Uh, the uh, the article, just to just throw out credit here, is uh, Lawrence uh, Darmiento from the L.A. Times. Uh, he had a great uh, sort of summary line. Uh Uh, about that panel. He said, uh, quote, it was hard to say that any comprehensive concrete solutions emerged out of the discussion, though there was much talk (laughs) about the need to improve educational opportunities in lower income neighborhoods. Right. So like that. And that was part of Dalio's letter to shocking realization. Yeah. The other thing like that, you know, and you brought this up last week or one other week about uh, calling profits alpha. Uh, which is like what oh, everybody yeah. does, and it's super annoying. Like every conference panel is about increasing alpha. Uh, <laughs> uh, like <laughs> so, like they want to do, they want to, you know, they want to tax yeah. the rich, and they this is like so. Uh, in a nutshell, right here's this emerging rhetoric that we're tracking: billionaires talking about how we absolutely need to reform capitalism because it's not working for everybody. What that means is returning to the American dream and promoting ideas that work, which doesn't mean any. Uh, uh, But whenever it comes to concrete solutions, uh, they all, uh, uh, whether it's improving education, improving infrastructure, improving um, uh, access to nutrition, all of these work through private public partnerships. So what we're really 
talking about here, whenever we're talking, whenever like these billionaires are at these conferences or writing their letters on LinkedIn or whatever, uh, and they're saying, "Oh, we need to reform capitalism," they're not actually. <laughs> Calling for a reform of capitalism. It's this is what this amounts to is a conservative strategy, uh, whereby uh, they are uh, trying to create a space in which they will have an increased influence uh, over tax policy and over the direction of American social institutions. What are you talking about today? Uh, I'm talking about Scott Simplot, uh, CEO of the JR Simplot Company. Uh, Simplot sounds like one of those, uh, like, I don't know, like mashup words that they do for businesses, like simulated. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Plotting. I don't know. But it's not. It's just his name. Uh, uh, Simplot. <laughs> Simplot, yeah. Is Simplot outside of Idaho? Is Simplot a household name? Do people know about the Simplots? <sighs> It depends. Uh, you know, they've had they've been involved in a bunch of controversies. And so people may have heard of them. So I, I, my feeling is that if you ask somebody, like, have you heard of Simplot? They'll be like, yeah, that sounds familiar. That's kind of that's kind of my feeling, too. I feel like it's not the first time I've heard that name, but it might be. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of featureless, uh, very much like Scott Simplot, uh, the guy I'm talking about. Uh, Scott Simplot. Yeah. I encourage you to look up a picture of this guy uh, because he looks exactly like a frozen French fry. Uh, he looks like a frozen <laughs> crinkle cut French fry. Uh, okay. That's, that's what the company is famous for making. Uh, they supply more than 50% of the potatoes for McDonald's French fries, which are not crinkle cut. I know. I'm not so out of touch that I don't understand that McDonald's French fries are not crinkle cut, but, um, you know. I just call it like I see it. He looks like a yeah. Cat. No, um, we're we're with you. Yeah. So, what do we got to know about this guy? He was born rich. Uh, his father sent him to Wharton Business School, and then he returned home to run the family business. Uh, and he has been running it since his father died. Um. So, like, yeah, you know, Scott Simplot himself, uh, really. It is not particularly interesting. There's two things uh, that I think are interesting about the son, Scott. One is that he has been focused on diversifying a uh, Simplot company, which is a large uh, multinational uh, agribusiness conglomerate. He's been focused so on- So moving beyond just potatoes. Beyond potatoes, beyond the food-related stuff that they had been in, you know, it's food, fertilizers, anything to do with agribusiness. He, he's pushing them into uh, uh, doing information technology stuff. Uh, so I, I'm not exactly- Is that sure. what they taught him at Wharton? I guess so. Yeah, you probably took a class like new markets and they were like information technology. And he's like, Dad, I have an idea. And so then, you know, <laughs> uh, okay. so there's that part. Um, so he's like he, he's trying to do some different things with the business, which I guess is, you know, something. And the second thing is that he is a bit he is the name most associated with cloning animals for meat. Uh, he that's kind of interesting. Research for animal cloning. Yeah. What does it mean to have his name most associated with it? He's just put a bunch of money into I this so. research? Yeah, yeah. And he, you know, proselytizes about it, I guess. Um, hmm. Yeah, but the, I mean, he, he's pretty boring. The real figure is J.R. Simplot, his father, uh, who is, he was born in 1909 and lived to be 99 years old. Um, he was the wealthiest man in Idaho. Um, and when people think of Idaho potatoes, they think of Simplot. Uh, he even claims that he gave Idaho its start as the potato capital of the United States. Uh, but I think that there is some disagreement about whether that's true or not. Um, okay. so they all, you know, they are big into Idaho potatoes. Uh, they also own a bunch of other stuff, frozen meat, frozen vegetable companies. Uh, they're big, big into fertilizer production and phosphate mining. And that's like where, you know, Outside of potato sales, that's where most of their money comes from. Can I interject for a second? Yeah. I mean, uh, the obvious question is, why is Idaho a good place for potatoes? Uh, is there a, is climate, there a thing? I believe. Uh, you know, uh, potatoes do better in cooler climates. Uh, they can do well in soil that's not all that great, I think, if you 
dump a lot of phosphates. But on. why not like Maine? Or, you know, I think they, they do have Maine. facilities in Maine. In fact, in my research, I came across an EPA Superfund site that uh, the Simplot <laughs> company <laughs> made in Maine. Okay. So, okay. Um, All right. Yeah. Um, okay. Sorry to interrupt. Keep No, keep, no. Keep uh, it moving. Uh, that was a good question. Uh, we're going to be talking about climate and potatoes a little bit later. Um, you know, uh, it, like J.R. Simplot, he was like a he he kind of like dressed and talked like Boss Hog, like big cowboy hat, white suits, and and very sort of homespun, you know, kind of stuff. He dropped out of school in the eighth grade uh, and went into farming, and uh, um, you know, he he it, 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 from the story I've t- told so far, it sounds like maybe he's some kind of farming genius or business genius, uh, but that's not exactly <laughs> the case. Uh, <laughs> He, Why don't um, we hear more about farming geniuses? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, we should. I, think, I mean, I know, know they're actually. Active. I mean, in his defense, I think he did invent a couple of things. Actually, no, that's not true. Uh, a scientist at his company invented a way to uh, ship frozen French fries uh, in such a way that they were better for some reason. I don't know. They're crispier or didn't spoil or something like that. And that's what got McDonald's to go all in on Simplot potatoes. Uh, they were like, your frozen potatoes just are yeah, awesome. Yeah. And so that was a huge boon uh, to the business. However, that's not how they got their start. The The way that he really got rich was from World War II. Uh, he uh, uh, was the main supplier of dehydrated potatoes for MREs for soldiers. Hmm. Um, that's interesting. Yeah. And, and that, that government contract made him a lot of money. And then he used that money to buy up a bunch of land. And then he also started vertically integrating by buying phosphate mines. Uh, and so that like he controlled the potato farming. He controlled his fertilizer. Also the fertilizer. Right. And so yeah. that cut his costs uh, as compared with other potato farmers. And then that allowed him to grow even more. And then he became this massive uh, potato agribusiness. Oh, that's smart. Uh, yeah. Good for him. Good for him. Um, so yeah, uh, he's a weirdo. He drives around in a Lincoln Continental with a Mr. Spud or did he's dead, uh, in a Lincoln Continental, uh, that said Mr. Spud on the license plate. Uh, he (laughs) was famous for, uh, I don't know what's with these conservative guys. And like, uh, like they, it's, they, he's a big Trump guy. Uh, Trump, uh, he's again, he's dead, but his son, uh, uh, his family people are very, you know, sort of, uh, invested in Trumpist politics. And uh, if you remember, you remember that story about Trump getting in trouble for flying an American flag that was like too large and he had to like pay fines to some city. I don't, I don't think I heard that. I don't remember the details, but it's probably, you know, some sort of like propaganda thing. Uh, but anyway, J.R. Simplot actually did this. Uh, he had a flag that he flew on his property that was so large, the neighbor's started complaining because of the noise that it made when it flapped in the wind. Like it was a, a nuisance flag <laughs> because it was so loud. Yeah. He's a, uh, he's a weirdo. Um, so anyway, so there's that, you know, he's an eccentric, uh, billionaire. Uh, the Simplot family itself is kind of like, uh, you know, what passes for an aristocracy in Idaho. Um, he, uh, uh, his daughter, so I already talked about Scott Simplot, Scott's sister. Scott's the guy who you did, whose name you drew in roulette, right? Scott. Yeah. That's why. Yeah. Scott came up. So J.R. Simplot died in 1999, uh, no, sorry, 2009, uh, at 99 years old. And, uh, and so Scott Simplot inherited the business, but also his sister, Gay Simplot, uh, uh, inherited a lot of it. She's also a billionaire. And, uh, when you know it, she married... The guy who would become the governor of Idaho, uh, Butch Otter, uh, Clement Leroy Butch Otter, the 32nd governor of Idaho. What a name. It's such a weird coincidence. It's like the, you know, the uh, pilot flying J uh, guys, you know, related to uh, governors, governor of of Tennessee. Uh, The biggest business in Idaho is related to uh, the governor through marriage. It's just like, it's almost like you start to think a whiff that of maybe oligarchy. it's not a coincidence. It's very weird. Um, uh, so anyway, uh, you know, there was nothing, there's nothing in Butch Otter's history uh, other than marrying gay Simplot that uh, would suggest that he would one day become a governor. Um, here's a, a quick quote from a, a, an article, a profile of him in The Hill. Uh, Otter, quote, 
talks plainly about such past embarrassments as bad grades, divorce, a DUI conviction, and winning a Mr. Tight Jeans contest. Uh, uh, <laughs> he met Gay Simplot while he was working on a road construction crew. Uh, he married her, started working for Simplot. Well, so hold up, hold up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> how do we, how do we imagine that their first encounter took? Was she just driving by in a limousine and he was hey, out there? That's what it says really in the go- bio. It doesn't make any yeah. sense to me. So apparently, this woman was just driving. She was in a convertible. Like he tells the story, like he saw her driving in a convertible, and he's like, "I'm gonna marry that woman." But like, <laughs> so. A random woman passing by in a car uh, he um, fell in love with and then got married to, who also happened to be a billionaireess. Uh, and uh, and then I, I you know, uh, through that marriage and the money that came with it, uh, he was able to uh, run for governor. Uh, he became lieutenant governor while he was still married to her. And then during that period, they got divorced. And so when he actually became governor, uh, he was not married to the Simplot family, although they were still very close. I think it was an amicable divorce. Um, okay. So anyway, uh, there's that. Uh, oh, you know, and, and the really interesting thing, this is the last thing I'll say with the like bio stuff. Uh, if you've heard of them before, it's probably not because of the McDonald's thing, but because of the two headed trout thing. Uh, I, I have you, do you hear about that before, Joe? The, <laughs> no, you know, the, no, it's not I remember on my radar. The, the three eyed fish from the Simpsons, which it turns out was long. Oh, yeah, long I do remember that. The two headed trout. Uh, so anyway, uh, the the the, the funny story, uh, I'll tell you the story of like what, what the two headed trout because it got misrepresented in the news a lot. So, uh, uh, Simplot's fertilizer mines the phosphate mines were like all cited by the epa multiple times for environmental regulations they're they're really terrible they they have apparently or at least you know in in terms of their marketing have turned things around um but they were a very very bad polluter uh and they're associated with a whole bunch of superfund sites uh all of their phosphate mines were putting uh selenium in the water uh so they made so instead of like they're like hey these you know, there's too many fines. Uh, this sucks. And so they made a report to lobby the EPA to change their rules on selenium pollution to allow their mines to pollute more. Uh, and part of that report was a picture of this two headed trout that had grown up on a fish hatchery and wasn't exposed to any polluted water. So their argument was we made one without selenium fit. <laughs> yeah, it's like fish can mutate. Without pollution, see? So you can't say that our selenium pollution is responsible for all these fish mutations that people are finding. And the EPA uh, bought it. I'm doing like really emphatic air quotes right now Hmm. uh, uh, because there's nothing about the the argument, I think, that they bought, right? Like this is uh, is during the Mm -hmm. Bush administration. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, So they were successfully lobbied. The EPA changed its guidelines or or its rules on selenium pollution. And so the Simplot company was allowed to pollute more uh, and make more two-headed trout. I could say more, but but I want to actually move on to talking about potatoes. Okay. Potatoes are very important. (laughs) Historically speaking, they're a very important crop. Uh, um, uh, Friedrich Engels, in fact, said that they were the equivalent of iron in their historical importance. And they're I have it uh, here somewhere in there. They're revolutionary, uh, he said. Um, uh, Can I, I'm going to interrupt you yeah. and, and, and just share a brief little thing. Not long ago, my wife and I on a, on a road trip were really struggling to kill time. And we created a game where we uh, invented one another spirit vegetables in the same way that you would do spirit animals. Uh-huh. And my spirit vegetable is a potato, according really? to my wife. Well, yeah. your head kind of looks like a potato. <laughs> go fuck yourself <laughs> uh anyway go ahead what was what was jill's spirit vegetable um a beet so both root vegetables huh i guess yeah now joe if you were in the 16th century uh people would probably think that both you and jill were poisonous because they were very suspicious of crops that grew underground and hmm. uh, at that time, they would not eat them. Uh, they would just feed them to livestock and poor people. Um, and uh, and that is maybe a great segue uh, into talking about the historical roles of potatoes. 
Um, Lay it on me. What do you know? Okay. So the potato is a new world food, uh, just like corn. Uh, I was thinking about this a little bit, and, and I think I, I want to call potatoes a modern vegetable. <laughs> so this is very weird, but 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 uh, stick with me. I think potatoes are a modern plant, and corn is a postmodern plant, right? A postmodern crop, I guess I should say. Um, and what I mean by that is like. Uh, corn has turned in, corn has been disarticulated from its role as a food. Like corn is a substance, right? Like corn has properly become an infrastructural raw material in a lot of different sectors. Like I looked Hmm. up some things that are made of corn. People have probably heard stuff like this before, but here's some things that are produced from corn. Uh, Artificial sweeteners, animal feed, fuel, plastic, adhesives, cosmetics, soaps, industrial cleaners, glue, diapers, paper, tires, and even, to make a callback to another episode, drywall. Uh, Drywall Hmm. is made from gypsum, of course, but uh, it's mixed with cornstarch to prevent molding. Um, Corn's in everything. Uh, So uh, That's pretty weird to think about. It is very weird to think about. uh, uh, And... um, uh, and, and so that's why I, I call it a postmodern crop, right? In the sense that it's been sort of deterritorialized from its uh, or or disarticulated from its like uh, um, uh, role as sustenance, right? It's like mm-hmm. it's used to make uh, materials and objects and, and things like that. Not so with potatoes. Potatoes are still mainly food for either animals or people. Uh, you know, they're they've found other uses, of course, for potatoes, but like mostly they're still food. Um, the major thing about potatoes is that they're like, you know, it's like a loaf of bread that grows underground, right? Like they are dense, calorie packed, nutrient packed plants, right? Like that they offer a lot of bulk to people's diets, right? And so the, the major role for potatoes uh, uh, and the major historical role for pot- potatoes was as fuel for people. Uh, and so... I wanted to talk a little bit about like the history of how potatoes became food for people, uh, because as I said at the beginning, uh, they weren't originally like they, the people thought they were poison when they came from the New World. They called them uh, the devil's apples, uh, which I thought was was funny. Um, hmm. And uh, this was like they arrived in Europe in the 16th century, uh, and they mainly used them to feed livestock, and uh, and also they fed them to poor people who they didn't care if they were poison. Uh, <laughs> not the poor people, but like, you know, uh, they, right. like, that's all they had to eat. Right. Like, so if they're poison, well, you know, you take your risk. Um, okay. but people started to eat them a lot more in the 18th century. And then like by the 19th century, there are a staple crop across Europe. Uh, and we think of the, the Irish potato famine, which I'll talk about in a second. Many people credit the potato with being the necessary, uh, calorie, uh, provider uh, for the population growth during the Industrial Revolution. So, without potatoes, there is no Industrial Revolution. Well, okay. So, I mean, this is this is kind of an interesting like argument that you, you get into. Like, it, would the Industrial Revolution happen had potatoes not presented themselves in an opportunistic way? to take over the role of major calorie producer for Europe? Or would have something else filled that role? Uh, yeah, something else probably would have filled the role, but like the potato made it um, uh, uh, that much easier. As it happened, As the it potato happened, right? played, yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Which led, I found the Ingalls quote, uh, he said that the potato was equal, the equal of iron in its historically revolutionary role. Um, and I have another quote here from uh, the media historian, John Durham Peters. Uh, uh, he he talks. Shout out to John. Shout out to John Durham Peters. Uh, he talks about the potato as a lesson uh, uh, in the over reliance on infrastructural techniques. He writes, uh, "Quote: The bigger the infrastructure, the more likely it is to drift out of awareness, and the bigger the potential catastrophe. There were no train crashes before the railroad was built, and no potato famines before the monocultural overinvestment in that crop in Ireland. Leverage means vulnerability." So I really like that last. I like that quote. Bit, right, like leverage yeah. means vulnerability. Um, uh, uh, cultural overinvestment. I mean, this is really a Harold An- Adams Innes point, right? Like the uh, a cultural overinvestment in a particular staple, whether it's a, a communication staple or a food staple or an industrial staple. If you become too reliant on a particular staple, it opens you up to a kind of vulnerability, a cultural vulnerability, right? And we were talking about this earlier, I think, right? Like that. 
um, uh, things like the Irish potato famine. Like when you over rely on somebody uh, on on some something, uh, you open yourself up to a collapse sort of situation, right? So there's that. So here's here's the really here's the really weird thing, and this is this is for me. This puts everything that I think about uh, in dialogue, and I think in an interesting way. And, and so I'm going to talk about a relationship between potatoes, uh, genocide, imperialism, um, uh, and what else? Uh, climate. Did I say climate? Oh, yeah. That's the main thing. I thought I said that first. But anyway, <laughs> um, so... So like I said, uh, people thought potatoes were poison at first uh, whenever they so they, they were brought back to Europe uh, from the New World in the 16th century, shortly after the uh, conquest of the Americas began. And uh, people thought they were poison. People didn't eat them. But people then started to eat them later on. And uh, um, and I want to talk about that moment. Right. It. it uh, one of the things about potatoes, and, and we talked about this, this is why they grow in Idaho, is is because they do very well in cooler climates. Uh, I live up in Duluth, Minnesota. Uh, people grow potatoes around here all the time. The boom in global potato farming happened during a period of climatological history called the Little Ice Age. Uh, the Little Ice Age was from the 16th to 19th centuries. Um, so... The, the Little Ice Age, nobody knows exactly why the Little Ice Age happened, um, but there's, you know, there's a couple of things that contributed to it, right? Like the, the, it's a polycausal phenomenon. There were some volcano explosions that put some, some ash into the atmosphere. Uh, there was some reduced solar activity, right? Like there are a couple of, of little contributing factors, but the main one that people talk about is the genocide of 60 million people in North and South America that took place uh, after... Uh, Europeans started crossing the Atlantic. When you kill, we're six- talking about the killing of Native Americans. Yes, uh, yeah, and and when you when sixty million people die, that means those people are not building fires and those people are not farming, uh, which means that forest reclaims the places that were being uh, used uh, that were being cleared for fire and cleared for farming. Uh, now people estimate that the total amount of land adds up to 56 million hectares, which is about the size of France uh, altogether, Hmm. right? And so you have suddenly, over the course of like 100 years, a new forest the size of France on the earth, right? Like, and and maybe larger. And what what forests are, are giant carbon sinks. And so uh, all of this new forest land reduced uh, carbon in the atmosphere, uh, seven to 10 parts per million, which has been verified in, in Antarctic ice cores. Um, and, uh, um, so it's a, it's a, you know, pretty well substantiated phenomenon, uh, that, uh, 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 that the, the death of all of these people had an effect on how much carbon was in the atmosphere and the amount of carbon in the atmosphere, uh, uh reduced, uh, global mean temperatures, uh, some, somewhat, and uh, some plants that were grown in Europe, some staple crops that were grown in Europe, suddenly started to not do quite as well. And people started noticing that the potatoes were doing better. Uh, and so people began to grow more potatoes because it was easier to produce a lot of calories uh, to fuel populations uh, with potatoes. So like this... Given the new climate situation. Right, so this massive genocide, which led to the discovery of the potato by Europeans... Uh, ended up creating a climate, uh, a, a moment in climate history that favored potato farming. Um, that is totally bizarre. Yeah, and so the the agricultural infrastructure of Europe uh, was in some ways the result of the genocide of sixty million people in the Americas. It was a very weird connection. Is there some sort of like object oriented ontology argument that could prove or suggest that? Potatoes were responsible for all of this. <laughs> <laughs> that would be amazing. And I think that you could make the argument without too much hyperbole that European conquest ran on potatoes. It was the main hmm. fuel source uh, for people. Uh, and, uh, and and like and, and I was trying to think like, well, can we argue that it still does? Right. Like <laughs> I think that you can make I think that you could make an interesting argument that like, it, well, a different kind of imperialism, right? Like a different kind of capitalist hegemony. Uh, that operates through 
the replication of say McDonald's restaurants across the globe uh, uh, is a is a different kind of imperialism that also runs on potatoes. Like you know, it's been such it's been such an important crop that it's like it's even responsible for allowing Europe to escape uh, what's called a Malthusian trap, which is just a, a kind of like a cool way to say a situation where your population outstrips your uh, agricultural capacities. Like you start making mm -hmm. more people than you can make food for. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the thing that saved Europe from that was the potato. Um, and uh, um so that's wild. It so, wild, so what's yeah. the, what the, what's the final takeaway? So the takeaway is, I think that all of these, uh, elements are in dialogue, right? Like we're able to think of them in an ecological way. So, uh, the history of the potato, the history of European colonialism and the history of the climate are all interwoven in this story in such a way that, uh, that we can see how each element is affecting the other elements. Let's learn something from you. Let's talk about. Uh, we're talking about H. Ross Perot Jr. Oh, shit, I forgot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if I could interrupt for one second, uh, I think that w it might be worth noting that we are both uh, talking about the sons of billionaires. Well, I was, I was, yeah, I was going to get into that. Yeah, I mean, there's, so there's, there's multiple similarities between my guy and your guy. The first and most obvious is that we are. You know, billionaires are like a self-propagating species. Yeah. You know, so we these are junior billionaires, billionaires made by billionaires, which you know I think is also like. And I want to map this out as we go along. Like, it seems like any billionaire who is uh, involved in a raw materials billionaire business, whether it's fossil fuels or. Uh, uh, um, you know, corn or soy or potatoes or whatever is uh, inherited that from somebody from a previous generation. And anybody who is a financial industries billionaire uh, is a newer billionaire. And and it's hmm. not going to be a general rule that applies to everybody, but it has been the rule for most of the ones that we've talked about. And so I that's an interesting that trend. trend, right? Like it's, it's probably it, and it well, and it's a trend that backs up our thesis, right? Like which is that billionaires have a stranglehold on all of the raw materials that we use to reproduce yeah. everyday life, and they have right. since a, a very long time, right? Since World War II, right? Like the the sort of um, moment of the hardening of the military industrial complex into a, a like a less flexible and more uh, globally integrated system, right? Like that. That's how Simplot made his money, you know, World War II, and and uh, this is like around that time, right? Like that's when. And I, I wish I was a historian of the economy or had one to tell me why that is. Um, well, it's uh, it's it seems like, and this is a very basic theory or attempt to analyze this issue, but, you know, infrastructure, it's difficult to get in on the infrastructure game, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. because it's so vast and it's so basic. It's part of, you know, the essential materials that create society. You can get in on the finance game more easily. Not that it's easy to make billions of dollars in, in any industry, but it seems to me that like you can just be a cowboy and go out there and, make some bets. Yeah. If you, Whereas, lucky, you can play the slots, right? Like, uh, you can, you know, yeah. if you're, you know, if, you, if you're somebody who's like consistently lucky, you can make a fortune, uh, or smart or whatever. But if somebody, but if you already, don't happen to already own all the gypsum exactly, in the world, exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I mean, the thing I, I think that's interesting about H Ross Perot jr is that he illustrates several different points that we've thought about or talked about on the show up until this point in, in different ways. One is obviously that he's a part of a billionaire empire and a billionaire family and that wealth continues to be held by these same families. And, and that's a, an issue that we've explored. He is also, as I'll talk about a little bit later, his business is explicitly infrastructure. You know, like potatoes are infrastructural, but the Simplots wouldn't say that they're in the infrastructure business. Yeah. H. Ross Perot would. Mm -hmm. And I'll explain why. He owned the Dallas Mavericks for a moment in time. 
talk about that. Mm. But he's sort of like typical of all of these different trends that we're starting to map yeah. and understand. Like at this point, I feel like the majority of the people that we've talked about have owned a sports team. <laughs> yeah, it's weird. <laughs> yeah. So annoying. And it's not, you know, we're just, this is a random random roulette of billionaires, but they, a lot of them are part of this world. So look, I don't know a whole lot about H. Ross Perot Jr., but everything that I do know about him makes me dislike him. <laughs> <laughs> um, he is, well, in the, <laughs> in the words of Mark Cuban, what I do know is that being in business with Ross Perot is one of the worst experiences of my business life. <laughs> Thanks. I don't know what history is going to have to say about Ross Perot Jr., but it's possible that the most cited accomplishment of his life will turn out to be the fact that he was the first person to ever circumnavigate the globe in a helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> and the story behind this... It's the most annoying thing I've ever heard. <laughs> dude, it's super annoying. And the story behind this is actually kind of amazing. So we're back in 1982 and some Australian guy, I'm forgetting his name, sets out to be the first person to circumnavigate the globe in a helicopter. And there's a big publicity moment surrounding the event and people around the world are suddenly aware that this Australian guy is setting off on this journey. So he's up in the air in the helicopter doing this. And the the challenge in this moment in time is during the Cold War and getting landing rights in different countries that make the, the path work so that you can refuel is like a big pain in the ass. So he, he's figured out a path that's going to work for him. And he's like a couple of weeks into his journey. Wait a second. When, so yeah, when you're when, circumnavigating the globe in a helicopter, you get to stop and refuel? Yeah, that well, that's that. Yeah, like what, that's this goal. What's the point this, then? Like, no one had ever done it before. Well, so dude, check this out. <laughs> so that's <laughs> that's the record. You get to stop and refuel, but you just get to say that you did it in the same helicopter as part of one continuous voyage. I guess. Okay. Um, so he's. And so it's going to take several weeks to pull this off, and he's a couple of weeks into the journey when H. Ross Perot finds out that this Australian guy is out there and he, he's like, fuck that. Like an American should do this. And he calls his dad. He's like, I'm going to do this. And his dad's like, yeah, you're going to do this. Hell yeah. He, he yeah, gets boy. up in a helicopter like two weeks later. <laughs> yeah, Seriously. They throw together a, like a plan to do this in like 13 days. And he just starts flying, just chasing the Australian <laughs> And winds up beating him and becomes the first guy to do it. But it's just like, I think that gives you a window into the oh, psyche of yeah, this dude. Yeah. So I was mentioning earlier that he was briefly the owner of the Dallas Mavericks. Um, he sold the Mavericks ah. in 2001 after owning it, I think about four years, to Mark Cuban mm -hmm. for $285 million. During the time that he was the owner, the team was pretty horrible. And he didn't seem to really care very much about <laughs> the team. I think he was using, it was just like a business decision to help him work out some public private partnership deals that I uh, maybe to discuss in a little bit more mm -hmm. detail later. That's a big but term so, in infrastructure, public private partnership. Deal. Yeah. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about this later because I know you had some ideas about this earlier on in the show or in a previous show episode. So Okay, he sells the Mavericks to Mark Cuban in 2001, but he retained a 5% stake, which this is what Cuban ultimately really regrets. Because uh, several years later, I don't exactly understand why things got so bad between Cuban and Perot, but what, what happened was that Perot winds up suing Cuban, accusing Cuban of poor management, claiming that the Mavericks were insolvent. His defense files this legal brief with photos of <laughs> the Mavericks celebrating their first national championship, <laughs> being like, this photo is proof that Mark Cuban is a good owner. <laughs> <laughs> and the courts were like, yep, that's right. <laughs> and 
Perot basically got completely faced and everybody sort of thought his whole lawsuit was a complete joke. Um, so anyway, those are just a couple of little like fun tidbits. So now to, to move on to his business, which as I mentioned before, is a business that is fundamentally dedicated to developing different kinds of infrastructure. So his company is called Hillwood. It's a real estate company. Mm -hmm. It's massive. It does residential, commercial, and industrial projects. But it specializes in these public-private partnerships. And the, the biggest, most famous project that Hillwood is known for is creating this master-planned community outside of Fort Worth called Alliance Texas. And this is a 26,000-acre mixed-use development that uh, was created in partnership with Dallas-Fort Worth and the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration. And it's now like this booming place with 500 companies, and Amazon is building a air freight facility there as it's trying to develop its private air freight service mm -hmm. and Facebook has a data center there. Um, and so it's like it's a gated industrial park or something like ultimately it's what's called an inland port. <laughs> so it's a, it's a place where all of these different goods are being processed for shipment before they move on to their final destination. Right, right. So it's kind of like an epicenter for logistics. Okay. And the the vision that he charted out in the late 1980s to to build this place that was going to I don't know be a be a home for all these different businesses and to move different sorts of products all over the world. This is the most visible example of like what he's all about. That's interesting. Like so it's like basically a big piece of uh capitalist infrastructure, right? So like it's uh, a logistical hub for just like, but out of nowhere, right? So like most of the, most of the uh, shipping and receiving and distribution hubs that we have are um, <clears throat> either ports, obviously, uh, or uh, like the one I live in, uh, or uh, like train yards, right? I mean, there are train yards in the Midwest that are not connected to bodies of water uh, that serve as major distribution points. But like, so this is just, it's like a pre, it's like a prefab pre-planned uh, uh, epicenter for business. Exactly. I mean, my, my understanding of it is it's sort of like a city that was built in order to execute certain parts of the supply chain management process. Mm -hmm. And there are all kinds, I mean, it's turned into a bunch of different things. I think now there's, there's a ton of rich people who live there. There's a golf course, there's a NASCAR track, I think, don't quote me on that, but I feel like I remember hearing that. But I think the interesting thing to realize or think about is like, who comes up with an idea to, to, to create a, a mothership for <laughs> supply chain management, yeah. you know, you, you have to be a billionaire already basically, yeah. or like dialed into the world of billionaires to understand that controlling infrastructure is the way to go. Yeah. Cause the other thing that you need to do in order to create things of this scale is you need to be able to really work the government officials and get people to do you favors. And you, you know, like your average business person just does not have that level of swagger to, to be able to like move pieces that are that yeah. big. And so, you know, like he's a big time Republican seems to have a lot of respect for things that Trump is doing right now. The company itself seems to be, there's no obvious evidence of like big major scandals, but it's clear that it's a company that's just used power to uh, become more powerful. Right, yeah. <laughs> He's in partnership with Uber to develop flying taxis. Yeah. So that'll be cool. I've, I've looked around. There's like, there are several billionaires. Uh, isn't Larry Page doing it too? Like uh, so there are several tech billionaires working on flying cars. I mean, I remember you were developing all these ideas related to public private partnerships. You know, it just seems to me like that's one of the real swindles that, that oh, yeah. billionaires who are building massive infrastructure projects have figured out, you know, to actually get yeah. the public in the name of like creating jobs, which is this very complicated idea that, is obviously 
good in some ways, but also what does it really mean when you're saying that you're creating jobs? It doesn't mean anything, right? Like the public private partnerships are a ruse. It's just a way to uh, build, build infrastructure less efficiently uh, with the added bonus of giving uh, a lot of, of generating a lot of surplus value that can be skimmed off by capitalists. Like there, there's, like there's no, there's no good reason not to raise taxes and build infrastructure in a sort of uh, FDR sort of way, right? Like that you could have a jobs guarantee, uh, you could have massive infrastructure projects that would, and and like, and this is why like Trump came into office uh, on day one. Talk, I mean, how many infrastructure weeks have there been? There have been like five or six of them. He's just constantly trying to put it back on the agenda. Uh, because he knows they all know, as you pointed out, right? Like that the real money is in real estate. Uh, that that stuff is uh, is where you want to put your money because it's safe. And uh, the public private partnership as a kind of neoliberal solution to climate change is going to uh, be like, you know, no regime of private public partnerships regarding infrastructure that we've ever seen before, right? Like so I mean, like my my sort of, you know, pet conspiracy theory about, uh, Trump's kind of economic plan, like his his i in his ideal world, I think as a person who, you know, uh, sees himself as a builder, uh, would be to uh, do a massive infrastructure bill that was uh, focused on public private partnerships that would feed money to uh, his friends and and likely himself and his own businesses. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, like, I mean, it, it, and, and and not only that, but like, um, <clears throat> you know, of course, you know, the United States has crumbling infrastructure. He's always talking about airports and, and transportation and things like that. Uh, but really, uh, the the infrastructural needs that are going to be generated by climate change are, I mean, it would make, you know, it, it's going to make uh, uh, rebuilding all of the nation's airports look like child's play, right? Like it's, it's going to be a thousand times larger than, than those kinds of infrastructural projects. And so if you all, if you set down a template for how we do infrastructure along private public partnership lines, right? If that, if that becomes the way that we think about how infrastructural projects get completed, uh, then moving into the era where people are addressing climate change in a serious way or trying to address climate change in a serious way, right? Like that's, that's going to be a huge, huge cash cow for uh, the billionaire class. Uh, so, yeah. So I think, I yeah. think, they, I think they all, I mean, no matter how much they deny it, they believe in climate change and see it as a real infrastructure op opportunity. Uh, now it's not to say that they're not going to, we talked, we've talked about, you know, sort of uh, the market inertia that billionaires impose uh, on the world, they're going to milk the fossil fuel industries for everything that it's worth until it's no longer profitable or too problematic to engage in for one reason or another, which is why they're also talking about coal. But if you think that they don't have their eyes on uh, green energy solutions and uh, remaking every building in the U.S. to be more energy efficient, redoing all the plumbing, all the lighting, all the water filtration <laughs> systems, every bit of infrastructure that's going Going to be uh, need to be made uh, 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 according to principles of sustainability or permaculture or whatever. Right? Like, yeah, of course they know that, right? Like they're, they're not, you know, and and that's that's you know those, <laughs> like, you know, it's just like the Sopranos and the you know the Esplanade, you know, thing. Oh, a bunch of construction is going to happen. Cool. How do we get our fingers in that pie? Right? Like, uh, yeah, so. yeah, yeah. So, oh yeah, my final thing. I made a big deal out of this when I pulled H. Ross Perot off of the roulette. In my lifetime, I think I've been in the same room with billionaires two times. And the first time, it was in a bathroom with Ross Perot Sr. Wow. <laughs> in 1993 or 94, what? Or around there. That's, yeah. right after, and I ran, that's right after he ran for president. Exactly. And I recognized him and I was like, tw like 12 years old or 11 years old. And I, I remember just going, he was like washing his hands and I just went up to him and went, hi Ross. <laughs> <laughs> what did he say? And he was weirded out and he kind of left in a hurry. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently well, his friends don't even call him Ross. I learned no, later. Uh, um, I can't remember, but yeah. 
That was like, I was just right up in his face. I'll remember it for the rest of my life. Not Ross Perot Jr. I, but Ross Perot Jr. might have been at this event, for all I know. But I don't remember seeing him. My only Not final... to Ross Perot in a bathroom. He's a freak. Um, I was too young to know... What? Yeah, I mean, it was weird. I don't. Do you remember? It's not the, like I, I mean, the whole the thing that people remember about Ross Perot is that he withdrew from the. Well, first of all, like I I love him because he's sort of like the first insane billionaire to just like come out of nowhere and be like, I'm running for president. Like you know, like, just like <laughs> yeah. you know, like no, you know, just like straight out of out of the blue. Uh, but he withdrew from that race because he said that nefarious actors were trying to disrupt his daughter's wedding with computer doctored photos of her. And I don't know what they were. Oh, I, I forgot what about photos this. were supposed to be of or, or what, but like, he's like, I have to withdraw from the presidential race because someone has fake photos of my daughter that would embarrass her and disrupt her wedding. Like, <laughs> Uh, it was, Weird. It was the I need to worst go back and use for anything that anyone had ever heard. <laughs> like the, the, the dumbest. Uh, but it turned. I, I think it, it turned out because uh, I, I looked this up not too long ago. I, it did turn out. I think that there was a guy who had actually told Ross Perot that he had these pictures, but he was just some nut job who made it up. Uh, I guess, and Ross Perot was dumb enough to believe him. Like, can, can you imagine what? having having a president that go? Well, I guess we don't have to imagine it, but like, uh, but like that is some <laughs> next level gull- gullibility. Like, <laughs> wow, wow, yeah. But that's all I got. Uh, that's great, um, Ross Perot, man. So, should we go into spinning the wheel for next yeah, episode? Let's spin the wheel. Riley Bechtel, oh, sorry, Riley Bechtel of the Bechtel Corporation, uh, great grandson of founder. Ah, engineering and construction. What is Bechtel? I know that name. How do you spell it? B E C H T E L. Oh, yeah, I've seen that around. Hmm. All right. Well, that's one. The second billionaire, giving that wheel another spin, is Bernard Saul II of B.F. Saul Co., founder and owner. Uh, Bernard Saul? Bernard Saul II of B.F. Saul Real Estate Investment Trust. He is in real estate. All right, so we got a real estate guy and a construction guy. We haven't talked too much about that yet. Uh, So I'll be... uh, I mean, Perot was a real estate guy. I probably could have done a better job developing his real estate holdings. Yeah, but he has so many other things. I guess we talked about, yeah, we we talked about his planned community, but I I don't know. I mean, there there are a million angles in real estate. Uh, One other thing, just afterthought. He looks a lot like Stanley Druckenmiller. Oh, really? Yeah. Junior? Junior, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, just needed to get that in. Yeah. Uh, Bernard Saul seems kind of boring. I'll take him because I've been getting the good ones lately. Okay. Uh, I'll take Bechtel. All right. Um, well, this was great. Thanks for all your hard work and research. I thought, uh, potatoes were fun and weird and interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I love talking about agriculture. I think, uh, I would like to do that more in the future. Uh, so I hope we get some, I hope we get some agribusiness people. It's such a weird world. I mean, we didn't even talk about like uh, <laughs> the Simplot company. Uh, there's a big controversy recently because they developed a genetically modified potato uh, called the innate potato. Uh, <laughs> I-N-N-A-T-E, innate potato. Uh, and like McDonald's won't use it. I don't, it's, it's very, uh, it's like they're, they're into like cloning and GMOs and, and all kinds of weird stuff. Um and that's like okay. a whole nother area that like we didn't even crack. So I'm sure we'll come to it. All right. Well, any final thoughts? Uh, no, looking forward to the next episode. Uh, thank you everybody for listening. Um, and, uh, and we'll see you back here soon. Okay. Rock and roll. <laughs>